Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Fritz Mayer, Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of a new series at Corbell, the Scrivener Dialogues, Conversations About Public Policy, sponsored by our Doug and Mary Scrivener Institute of Public Policy. We're extremely pleased to welcome today the former director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, Cecilia Munoz, as our first speaker. Welcome, Cecilia. Wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be part of the, the opening, the inaugural session. Absolutely. It's, it's really, can't think of a better person to inaugurate this series. This is a doubly special occasion for us at the Corbell School because we're also welcoming the new director of the Scribner Institute and Associate Professor of Public Policy, Dr. Nazneen Barma, who will be moderating today's discussion. Professor Barma joined us earlier this month from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, where she has been teaching for the last 10 years. Prior to that, she spent several years at the World Bank. She has a BA and MA in International Relations from Stanford University and an MA and PhD in Political Science from Berkeley. She's co-director of the Bridging the Gap program, a very influential program in political science, a fellow in the Berggruen Institute's Geopolitics and Globalization program, and a widely published author. Her most recent book is The Peace Building Puzzle, Political Order in Post-Conflict States. Nas is just the perfect person to lead a policy program embedded in a school of international affairs. Someone who thinks global to local, who's committed to scholarship that matters, and to training that will empower our students to tackle the great issues of our time. We are just thrilled to have lured her east over the mountains to join us here at the Corbell School. Before I turn the proceedings over to Nas to properly introduce our guest and to moderate the conversation, let me acknowledge that I believe we're joined today by Doug Scribner, whose gift to the university established the Doug and Mary Scribner Institute of Public Policy. So welcome, Doug. And with that, I again welcome and turn to my colleague, Professor Lazneen Barma. Thank you so much, Fritz, for, for that incredibly generous uh, introduction. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, the, the most important uh, title I have uh, is the one I hold today, which is uh, Director of the Scrivener Institute of Public Policy. I'm really um, so happy to be here. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, as Fritz said, uh, I couldn't have imagined uh, a more wonderful person to, to begin uh, to have the inaugural uh, Scrivener Dialogues with than Cecilia Munoz. Uh, Cecilia, I'm going to give you a brief formal introduction uh, uh, to, the, to the audience. Uh, Cecilia is Vice President for Public Interest Technology and Local Initiatives at New America. Prior to joining New America in 2017, she served for eight years on President Obama's senior staff. First as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, followed by five years as Director of the Domestic Policy Council. Before working in government, she was Senior Vice President at the National Council of La Raza, now Unidos US, the nation's largest Hispanic policy and advocacy organization, where she served for 20 years. She received a MacArthur Fellowship in 2000 for her work on immigration and civil rights. She is the author of More Than Ready, Be Strong and Be You, and Other Lessons for Women of Color on the Rise, published earlier this year, a book I heart heartily recommend. And Cecilia, we agreed to today to talk both about uh, some of the insights and lessons from your book, as well as some of your thoughts about um, public policy challenges um, we face today in the US. So without further ado, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. If I may start with a with a, with a question uh, about about your book, uh, you write in your book about the different incarnations in which you've charted a public policy career, from starting um, uh, after having we share we share a Berkeley background after leaving uh, the University of California Berkeley, going to Chicago, starting in immigration direct services, moving then into advocacy, especially focused on building um, what you kind of uh, I think really nicely characterize as a fact based narrative for policymakers on different issues and and uh, communities in the immigration world, and then of course into official policy making at the highest levels of government. So I wanted to ask you to please, if you would, reflect on the importance and, and value of all of these different approaches to policy making, as well as how they importantly come together in the formulation uh, of, of an implementation of public policy. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be part of this. It's lovely to see so many people um, engaged in showing up for this conversation. And um, uh, you, you know, you've asked me to talk about these different modalities of thinking about policymaking. And I think the most important thing I can say about that is that, you know, I don't come and I say this knowing that I'm speaking at a 
uh, Institute of Higher Learning and fo for folks who are being trained in public policy. So I'll confess and say that I don't have formal public policy training. My degrees were in literature, but my, the, the thing which ultimately qualified me to get engaged in making policy was that I worked in community. And that strikes me as really, really important because so much of policy making um, is hopefully well-informed and well-intentioned and evidence-based, uh, but it's also guesswork, honestly. Um, we're making uh, educated guesses about what's gonna have impact on people. Hopefully those guesses will be informed by what the data tells us. Uh, and sometimes there isn't sufficient data to, to tell us what's what, but we also frequently don't collect data on the communities whose lives we're trying to affect. Um, and, and we frequently aren't, policymakers are not as engaged with the communities, the, the people who are the point of policymaking as they should. Um, so the, the gateway to policymaking for me turned out to be through the service work that I was engaged in as a graduate student at Cal, um, where I, you know, I volunteered uh, for a legal services clinic. And then the work that I did, as you noted, in Chicago, helping lead a legalization program for immigrants. And I, I like to tell this story, especially when I'm with an audience of students, because I was very sure when I left graduate school that I was destined for a career in what I think of as direct service, meaning that I was going to work at a social service agency of some kind, and there would be people coming in who needed some kind of help, and I would be part of the team providing that help. And that's what I ended up doing when I moved to Chicago. And the, my team did a really good job, but I also learned that I, I'm terrible at direct service. It's not what I was cut out to do. Um, and the, what taught me that was that I agonized so much about the people that we couldn't help. Um, so much so that at one point I was speaking to a journalist and I heard myself describing my job. This journalist quoted me describing my job as being like watching people be pushed off a cliff knowing that you can only help some of them. And those are not the words of somebody who is energized by what they're doing. Um, so I learned that I wasn't cut out for what I thought I was going to be good at, but I also found my voice as an advocate in doing that work. And the people that we were seeing um, every day had big advocacy needs, and I learned that I was good at putting together what I was seeing and serving as a voice for those folks. And that's really what led me to a career in public policy. And it's I actually think it's tremendously important to have people engaged in policy who are also engaged in community. And I have over and over and over again throughout my career, you know, freak, been frequently the only woman in the room, more, even more frequently the only Hispanic person in the room, um, describing stuff that the people who are making decisions really need to know if they're gonna actually have the impact that they're seeking to have. Thank you. I just want to check that you can hear me now, Cecilia. Yeah, sure right. And sorry for that. Uh, for that, um, just sort of apropos of what you were just talking about, you tell a wonderful story um, in, in in your book about working on your first State of the Union speech in the in the White House at a time when, of course, the White House is grappling with a range of domestic policy issues while your immigration advocacy, co advocacy colleagues, with whom you've been working for a couple of decades, were pushing you to make statements on immigration specifically in the face of all of these different things swirling around. So I'm, I'm really kind of curious about how it was for you sort of in that moment to kind of hit transition from pushing on policy from the outside, as it were, what you're just describing, versus working on it, you know, from within at the heart of, uh, at the heart of it. Yeah, so I really wasn't sure that the skill set of me as a policy person as an, and as an advocate was going to transfer um, into the skill set that you need to be in a, in a government, right, to be actually governing. Um, but I knew when the, um, I, had, I had gotten to know President Obama when he was in the Senate, he asked me to serve and I had the sense of, well, he knew what he was getting, like he knew who I was when he asked me to serve. So maybe this is what he really needs me to do. So I understood that part of my reason for being there was that I had this advocacy experience and this community experience and that part of my job was to make that visible. But it's also true that, and this is, I, I think I, I spoke to seven women of color when I was writing the book and, and every single one of them described versions of this experience that, when you're the only one in the room or you're the one that has a certain body of knowledge that other people don't have, um, if you are, you run the risk of being the person like the gadfly that everybody 
thinks they know what it is you're going to say because you're the one who always says the thing when everybody gets together and you don't want to be the person that everybody assumes, yeah, her job is to say the thing, you know, about her people uh, and we'll all nod politely and then we'll all move on along with what we were going to do. Like, you don't want to be that person either. So you're constantly calibrating. When is it my job to put this forward and to, and to make sure people can hear it and act on it? And when is it my job to hold back because they're not ready to hear, hear it or act on it? I feel like I, in the White House, I was constantly making that calibration and then constantly questioning whether I'd gotten it right. And in this particular instance, right, the state, this is the first state of the union. We're still in the middle of a huge economic downturn. It's the, the, the you know, president's first time out making this speech. And he's obviously a very gifted orator. And every constituency, not just the immigration world that I came from, but everybody was in the frame of mind of like, if he would just wax eloquent about my thing, everything would change. And the immigration world very much thought that. So they were like calling up with like, here's the five paragraphs we think he should address. And I'm thinking, he's gotta do foreign policy, he's gotta do the economy. Like there's a, there's a lot that you have to cover in maybe 45 minutes. Like you don't want him to set the record, to, you know, land speed record for a State of the Union addresses. So it was clear to me there was gonna be a reference, but, it, but there wasn't gonna be a section and when the reference was finally written, it was it said the wrong thing, and so I had to, you know, find my way into. In this case, it was David Axelrod's office to, to make sure that we calibrated the language so that it would communicate what he needed to communicate to the country and to the community. And that was one of those times where I know the person sitting across the room from me is thinking, "Oh yeah, this is like the this is the Hispanic person who has to say the thing." And my job is to make sure he hears me because that's what the president needs from me right now. Um, and, you know, I, I, the, the formula for this, I think, is different every time. I have this debate actually with my daughters. I have two daughters in their 20s. I see myself as somebody who is, whose radar is going for, um, can the person in the room hear, really hear what it is that I have to say and how do I present it so that he or she can hear it and, and will be motivated to act. And what my daughters see is somebody who's constantly twisting herself into a pretzel so that she can get heard. And from their point of view, their thing is, you know, that's um, whoever, that's on them. They would, they prefer to present who they are and be just fully truthful. And if the people that they're in the room with can't understand it or deal with it, then their view is that's on them, not on me. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that this notion of calibrating in order to, um, in order to have some impact is, is a debatable point. And I, you know, and I appreciate that debate. Yeah. Uh, I think that's fascinating. And of course, especially in light of, uh, you know, somebody that who we've all been uh, grieving uh, this weekend, Justice Ginsburg, and, you know, somebody who, Played the long game, certainly, but also sort of, you know, knew when and the moments when it was sort of important to stand up for what you believed in, you stand up for what you believe in. And in, in a way, there's a, there's a, there's possibly a generational aspect here, right? I mean, uh, you know, some of us um, kind of coming up uh, today as women of color uh, have the ability to speak our minds because of people like you and Justice Ginsburg who've kind of done that balancing act over the course of your careers to kind of get uh, people, uh, you know, who look like us and who look like you into, into the room. So uh, that's, that's to say thank you. Um, and, you know, you write in your book, of course, about uh, the, the challenges that, that you and other women of color, and you, you interview a number of them in your book, uh, faced in becoming senior officials and, and recognized policymakers. And I think, you know, from my perspective still today, there's this mismatch between the recognition that of course we need diverse perspectives in policy making. Everybody knows that. But the difficulties that then those people with diverse perspective have breaking into these higher echelons in the policy world. And you talk so sort of honestly about your, your feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, um, and I guess I would ask you, you know, we have a number of public policy students uh, on, on, on the uh, seminar with us today, as well as a number of people working, our alumni who are working in policy today. What lessons do you think you feel most strongly about sharing with emerging policymakers from historically marginalized and underrepresented backgrounds? The most important message is, is, is oh my gosh, do we need you? Um, and that's really the reason that I wrote the book. Um, and I didn't walk out of the White House thinking, 
this is my time to tell my story. And the book isn't actually really my story. The book is an offering to women, in particular women of color, yeah. just with guidance and advice. And there are stories in it, not mine, but also from the seven other women that I interviewed. Um, but it's very intentionally trying to provide strategies because it turns out we all face a lot of the same things, but we don't really talk about it. Um, and so this is an effort to both talk about it and start the conversation, but also impart some strategies. I discovered that the women that I interviewed, we'd all been through the same stuff and we all developed the same strategies for dealing with it, but we had never really had the conversation. Mm -hmm. So the most important message, I think for me to people coming up who, who are interested in making public policy, particularly if they're people of color, particularly if they're from um, you know, traditionally marginalized communities, is um, the policy conversation needs you so badly, right? This goes back to what I said at the very beginning. We, policy needs to be informed by the experience of the people that, it, it's, that it's aiming to touch. And it can't be unless we're actually in the room making it. Um, and the, the feeling that, which I had a lot, which I've had a lot through my career, that while there's never been anybody like me sitting in this ch particular chair, um, I, you know, I tell stories in the book about how pe some people around me made it clear that they weren't so sure I belonged in the chair that I was sitting in. That, that's a common experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can have moments where you doubt, where if you've never seen anybody like yourself, nobody like yourself has ever served in that position or you're the only one in the room. There's a, a part of a voice, I think, for most humans, certainly for this human that says, what makes you think you belong here? And the, the most important message for me is that you do. <laughs> and that you, you need to be able to build the kind of reserves at your core that allow, that you can then draw from in those moments where you either hear other people's doubts or you have your own doubts. Because the people that you're sitting in the room with may not understand that they need you and what you bring and what you know, but they totally need you and what you bring and what you know if they're going to get to a good result. Um, and so they may not know that. So it matters that you walk in knowing that because that's what you will draw from when the, you know, when the chips are down, when you have to say the hard thing or the thing that nobody has considered or nobody under, else understands. Well, thank you. That's uh, again incredibly in in inspiring, and I've he I've heard that voice that you're talking about as well. So I appreciate it. it's it. You know, as you as you say in your book, I mean, having having uh, mentors, people who you can sort of share honestly with these uh, these um, you know concerns and fears, you know, um, and, and and doubts is is an incredibly uh, and and to be affirmed by um, by those people is incredibly um, powerful. Um, if you don't mind, I wanted to turn a little bit to some of the the policy challenges that that, that we face today, and to ask you, um, you know, some of your thoughts on um, on, on on them. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree that uh, 2020 has brought us a, a series of truly complex uh, challenges, even you know, even crises that have resulted uh, in deep human suffering, mm -hmm. uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic to the associated economic crisis to the wildfires raging in the West, uh, where I've just uh, come from. And other catastrophes precipitated by climate change as well in terms of hurricane season to the still unchecked uh, police violence against uh, black and, and BIPOC people uh, in the United States. So I, I wanted to ask you if you if you would, um, you know, it's a million dollar question. Um, what has been missing in the current response to these policy challenges at various levels of government and in terms really of how people who live in the United States feel like they're being governed right now, the sort of lived experience of being governed. Um, what, could you, what could you have to say about that? There's so much about this terrible year. <laughs> um, like I don't even have words big enough for you know, terrible doesn't seem like enough, right? But there's so much about this experience that we're all going through right now that has laid bare the ways that we've failed each other as a society, right? N Except for the pandemic, none of it is new, yeah. right? It's been true for a really long time, actually, right? The fact that our economy depends on workers, huge numbers of workers who don't earn a living wage, for example, like 40% of the workers at the government classified as essential workers and therefore had to stay on the job frequently without protection, um, also don't earn 15 bucks an hour, which is what you need to be able to survive in this country. So, um, and think about the caregiving population, again, uh, upon whom our economy depends, 
um, uh, again, grossly underpaid, not earning a living wage. And yet this is how, frankly, the rest of us who are not caregivers or who are relying on them are able to get to work, particularly women, by the way. Um, so we're learning, we're, I think, seeing more vividly something that was already true, but which we had learned to live with, um, with respect to folks who are being left behind economically. We're certainly um, learning lessons, again, that are not new, but which not, we didn't always see in the same way, um, about racial violence and police violence and the experience of, of black communities, of brown communities in this country, especially at the hands of law enforcement, but not exclusively at the hands of law enforcement. It feels to me like, it, it's almost as if like there's, there's a fog lifting and so we, suddenly we can see things that maybe we hadn't seen clearly before. Um, and the, you know, the question is what we do about that. And I say this with all humility as somebody who is, I've been in the civil rights movement my whole career. It's not like I didn't know this stuff. But I will also say that I am also learning from this moment. And that's the, I think, the spirit in which we need to approach it. And I'm trying really hard both to express my own community's experience. Right, I'm a Latina with, with a lot of experience in particular. My issue of greatest expertise is immigration policy. So I feel like this is a moment for me to do some talking. It's also an, a, a moment for me to do some listening. Right, um, and a moment in which I think we're all hopefully accepting that there's some maybe there's some stuff we didn't know about each other that we really need to know if we're gonna. It's not just if we're gonna succeed. I actually think this is stuff we need to know if multiracial democracy is gonna survive in this country and therefore in the world. Like if we can't make multiracial democracy work in the United States of America, it's not happening anywhere else, and we're kind of in trouble right now. Um, so that, so it feels to me like the, it's not a silver lining. Um, uh, I, I don't love that terminology for this, but there's the, there is a very dark side to everything we're going through. And our job is to also find the sources of light and room in that direction. And that means doing the kind of listening and learning that I talked about. And it also means, you know, taking on the deep work of a citizen in a democracy. Right? It is completely within our power to become who we need to be. But that requires um, showing up. And not just in the presidential election, it requires showing up when you're, you know, for the sheriff's election. And maybe most importantly, right, for the election of the sheriff and the prosecutor and the, um, right, the, the positions all up and down the food chain, which have profound, profound impact on people's lives. Indeed, and, and, and that is a good clarion call to, to everyone to, to please uh, register to vote if you if you haven't already and please, uh, uh, please, uh, please vote your conscience. Um, you know, I think you're, you're talking sort of so eloquently about the importance of empathy and, and public policy, the importance of lived experience, understanding the communities that you come from, the, the importance of understanding uh, and empathizing with other communities with whom you may not have such a uh, such a close uh, connection. Um, you're also talking about how you, you have this great quote in the book when you say at the beginning of the Obama administration in January 2009, amidst a similar sort of constellation of crises, right? The economic collapse, the H1N1 pandemic, the deep water horizon, oil rig explosion, and so on, when, uh, when, when you all used to say to each other, hard things are hard, right? I, I thought that was so uh, sort of evocative because they are, they're, they're, they're difficult. Um, and I guess the, the question that I have there that relates to this current moment is how do you, how, do, how does prioritization happen in terms of sort of public policy? You know, what are sort of the most important things uh, and, and how do you kind of prioritize among all these different crises uh, in a context that we're, uh, such as we're facing today? Exactly. I mean, that's exactly the work of, of a policymaker. And that's, um, in some ways, it was the scariest stuff that I had to deal with in the years that I was in government. And in some ways, also the most exhilarating is you realize, like, oh, there's no, there's no grownups gonna, that are going to show up here and tell us what to do. Like, we're the grownups. We're like, it's, this is it, which is a really sobering thing, right? You like to think about in the various moments of crisis that our country has been through, that there were some like serious grownups who like knew what they were about and the way was clear and they led us out of the wilderness and that's just totally not how it works, right? These moments of crises, the, you know, and even in the best of times, 
the folks with their hands on the levers are like regular schmoes who are doing the best they can. Uh, and it is scary to be one of those. And uh, you know, I think fear is entirely appropriate in that circumstance. And so the way you prioritize is um, really comes from like the thing which is duty number one, really, it, when you're governing, when you're in the government, is you have to make sure that you're protecting people, mm -hmm. right? So in the, this is, seems so clear in this moment of pandemic, that's job number one. That's the thing we have a government for, right? Is to make sure that people are safe and then have the ability to live their lives in with some degree of safety. It's, why, it's fundamentally why we have governments. Um, and there are a lot of different kinds of threats to that. So there's the defensive work that you have to do and that and you have to leave some bandwidth for a crisis and felt like we had a lot of them when I was in government. And then there's also the affirmative work that you have to do, which is about creating opportunity and kind of moving the ball forward. And you have to do some mix of both. And hopefully, you know, you work for a, an executive who with clear values and vision, which I did. Um, and so, the president himself made it clear what the priorities were, and that you know that that that's a pretty good north star to steer by. And then, sort of within that, my job as domestic policy advisor was to um, kind of drive the decision making to him that was about either advancing his agenda or addressing things which could undercut it. Um, and you know, invariably, there are surprises and things that you don't expect, and it's it, you know, interesting that. So I, this book was published in April of this year, just at the beginning of the lockdown, which means that it went to the publisher like a full year before, as you know, because you're the author of many books. Um, and if I write about this, the thing that I worried about the very most during the transition from the Obama administration to the current administration was a pandemic. Mm. Because we, we had a couple, right? We had H1N1, we had Ebola, we also were dealing with the Zika virus. So I learned a lot about what it takes to do this well. And we had a, um, a, a briefing, it was a tabletop exercise, which is required by law during the transition, in which the outgoing administration is kind of handing off to the incoming one, and you do exercises focused on the kinds of crises and disasters that are normal that you face, and one of them was a pandemic scenario. And the person sitting next to me, the incoming person, was not paying attention. <laughs> and I thought... I, you know, I may have feelings about you and your politics and, and your boss's vision, but you know what? This is a thing where I just really need you to succeed because if you don't, people die. And that's of course where we are. Um, yeah. Well, I think your, you know, the, your dictum, the number one duty, as you put it, to protect people is, you know, that that's a very profound uh, and very simple way of, of framing what, what government is for. And indeed, uh, you know, on the, on the pandemic, I think we, we can all sort of agree that um, we, we've been, we've been uh, disappointed to say the least. And, and um, you know, there are at all levels of government, I think, but, but certainly um, the, the administration. I, I wanted to ask, you know, related to this question, you know, you talked a minute ago about the importance of empathy in public policy making. Um, in addition to your role at, at, at New America, you also serve as a senior fellow for uh, at Results for America, which is a nonprofit that advances the use of data and evidence in, in policy making. And it often seems like, certainly with respect to the pandemic, but uh, other sort of challenges to robust policy making today is a willful denial of facts and evidence uh, for uh, purposes of ideology and, and, and political gain, combined with then a growing mistrust of expertise and a, a growing mistrust in the, in the business of, of public policy making. Um, do you think that this is an, env an environment in which policymakers will have to sort of just contend and continue to operate with in the foreseeable future? Or do you think that there are ways to, to resurrect trust in government and trust in evidence-based policy and governance? I worry about this a great deal because it's, um, I don't think it's like flicking a switch. I don't think you can erode the public trust. And then just with a mere change in administration, win it back. Um, and that's why, I mean, that is uh, among the many distressing things about this moment, the notion that some of the institutions that were most trusted that we could count on, like the Centers for Disease Control or the National Institutes of Health or the FDA, whose job is, the, these are science-based agencies um, you know, it's the, the proper way to govern with those agencies. And this is I, my, 
they're part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which kind of sort of reported up as part of the Domestic Policy Council, so I worked with them very closely. The point is the science-based agencies you don't mess with from a political perspective, like that's the way it's supposed to work. The notion, as the you know, news is broken today, that right, that, that they're, um, they're making political decisions on, about what's going up on the CDC or coming down from the CDC's website is absolutely appalling because the message it sends is that we as citizens now can't trust what we're seeing there, in which case, where are we supposed to get accurate information about how to keep ourselves safe? Um, I don't think it'll take just a change in administration and a group of trustworthy people, which I fervently hope we get, um, to, to change that. And I, I say that having had the experience of um, working in Flint, Michigan. So I'm from Michigan originally. And I, if you, I don't know if you remember the water crisis in Flint, which is still ongoing, but which happened initially during the Obama administration and the president went to Flint. We spent a lot of time and energy um, helping you know, the, the local government get to a place where the water was safe um, and helping provide information to the residents of the city to, to help them determine what they needed to do in order to be safe. And what I learned, and Flint is a very black city and these were folks who, you know, who have reason not to trust their treatment at the hands of the government. And it was a state level government decision which led to the poisoning of their water. Mm -hmm. And so they were not prepared to hear my colleagues from the you know, Environmental Protection Agency who were totally there to try to do the right thing, totally motivated by wanting to keep people safe. And what they were finding was people were saying, look, I heard the state say one thing, I'm hearing you say another thing. How am I supposed to, you know, I'm not sure I can trust any of you, so I won't. So I'm gonna go walk two miles today to get my bottled water because even though you're telling me my water is safe, I don't believe you. Um, so that is the result of, frankly, generations of good reasons for mistrust. And frankly, even an African-American president wasn't enough to persuade people that their government was trying to protect them. Um, so I, I don't think you can put these things back together quickly or easily. And that is a very, very dangerous dynamic. Um, uh, and so, but at the same time, to, so, so as to not be completely in the land of doom and gloom, um, there are great strides being made with respect to evidence-based policymaking all over the country, particularly by states and local governments. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Results for America, where I'm a senior fellow. Um, you know, they, they are advancing the ball on evidence-based policymaking. They're working with states who are doing really interesting, really exciting things and just making sure that they're addressing you know, the fundamentals of governing from public safety to trash pickup and recycling um, in innovative ways that are meeting the public's needs and saving money and, um, you know, and, and where they're able to demonstrate the impact that they're able to make empirically, right? So where they're not just making it up and saying, we did this really cool thing and hopefully it worked. They're able to say, actually, we made this innovation and here's how many people had you know, a change as a result of it. Um, so as a, the practice of policymaking is getting much more precise, the tools that we're able to access and use are getting more and more powerful. Um, and, but the innovating is all happening at the state and local level, especially now, because the federal government's a bit of a basket case. Um, you know, I think what you're describing in many ways sort of relates to my current research, which is actually on the relationship between state capacity on the one hand, the ability of, a, of, a, of the state or different levels of government to articulate and implement public policy and the legitimacy that comes from that, right? The sort of the procedural legitimacy that comes from when people have their trash picked up and when they can see the government sort of actually working on, on their behalf. And so indeed, I think it's important to emphasize that that is a route to resurrecting uh, trust in government as much as uh, some of the, um, the sort of more more, um, uh, you know, sort of narrative-based uh, elements of it are. I, I also just want to remind our uh, our webinar audience that Cecilia and I are going to chat for for a few more minutes here, but uh, we are going to uh, be having a Q and A session to wrap up uh, our session here. So please do uh, put your questions into uh, the, the the Q and A uh, function here on the on the webinar. I see a few coming in. I want to encourage uh, you to send in more, please. Um, 
Cecilia, you, you talked about, um, you know, the importance of when you're prioritizing in the context of a series of multiple crises going on, the importance of also keeping your eye on the long game uh, and the kind of deeper, longer uh, term policy agendas that, you know, you, you bring with you to government, that you bring with you as somebody who wants to serve the public. Uh, you know, we all have ideas about how sort of things could get better. Uh, and, and we don't want to just be putting out fires all the time. Um, Today, looking ahead, what do you see as the key domestic policy issues that must be addressed by the next administration? Um, and I'm especially eager to hear your views, views, of course, on what must be done on immigration policy, uh, race relations, and, and, and a renewed economic contract with working class Americans, things that um, you know, in, in many ways have, uh, have been left undone uh, for the so last few years. I think in some ways the economic contract and race relations are, are deeply related. I think too frequently policymakers think there's like a race and civil rights and criminal justice bucket, mm -hmm. and then there's an economic bucket, and they're not the same bucket. I mean, think about it. If you are not dealing with issues, uh, if you're not dealing with disparities, racial disparities and ethnic disparities, um, if, if you think the only place to deal with them is sort of when it is just when it comes to policing and criminal justice. In other words, we have vast work to do there. But if you think that's that's the place where you're dealing with race and how the economy is structured and who it's serving well and who it's not serving well isn't where you deal with racial justice, then in some ways you're just you're dealing with the downstream effects only of the central problem, which is that we have structures that are not working for everybody in the country, right? Our, our economic, the way our economy is structured is not working for, for everybody. And I'm a big fan of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, which is led by an economist named Heather Boucher, mm -hmm. who she makes the argument in, in a recent book called Unbound that we're just we're measuring the wrong things, right? That if that the the we're making there are economists making public policy that are measuring kind of traditional measures of growth, and if the economy is growing, the GDP is growing, we think we're doing fine. But if you look at if you, if you look at different indicators, if you look at the same data, but actually pay attention to where are their disparities and what is the proportion of people who are not able to, to um, live sort of by a particular standard and, and what's going on with kind of the, the, um, the disparities that are growing. If you look at other things that are also indicators of the health of our economy, you reach a different conclusion about whether things are okay or not. And so her argument is we're measuring the wrong stuff and if we measure more thoughtfully, we will reach a different set of policy conclusions. And, and that should be driving the decision making. And frankly, I'm very encouraged to see that the, I mean, I don't wanna have a, a partisan conversation and I'm sure you haven't invited me to have a partisan conversation, but there is a conversation about, are we building back the old economy or are we building something new? And I'm encouraged to see the conversation moving in the direction of, no, actually the old economy wasn't really working for everybody. Let's build something where the racial justice pieces are baked in from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do that well, going back to a previous point, we need people who know something about that actually making policy. And not just from an empirical perspective, but also from a lived experience perspective, right? And you know, this may be a controversial thing to say, and I say this lovingly towards the people that I have worked with who are skilled economists and great humans, but I think a little too much policy has been made by economists over the years. Um, and, you know, the economics field is um, pretty male and pretty white. And I think we can break all of those things open, and I think the country would be better off if we did. As a political scientist, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> we need more political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists. And I'm also, I actually also teach uh, political economy. And I always uh, um, mention to, to, to my students, the person who invented the concept of GDP, Simon Kuznets, um, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, uh, talked about how he thought it was an incredibly incomplete and sort of unsatisfying measure, all the different things that you're talking about here, you know, Heather Boucher's work and, and Kate Rayworth on, on donut economics and so on, all the different things that we ought to be measuring in terms of well-being, if we think about it in, in, in terms of social well-being and not just uh, economic growth. So I'm really encouraged to hear you, to hear you say that. 
I'm going to, um, uh, if, if you don't mind, turn to some of the questions because I think they touch on, uh, you know, a lot of what we've uh, just been uh, talking about here. Um, I have one from um, Julie DeWoody, um, who is one of my colleagues here at the, at the Corbell School, um, who asks, um, the ability to speak truth to power requires great vulnerability, and even more from women and people of color. How have you embraced that uh, during your career? And what advice do you have uh, for, for those uh, of us who are, who are trying to, to speak the same truth to power? A great observation. I am um, I'm careful about this because but for the 20 years before I went into government, I worked for, as you said, the, a group that was then called the National Council of La Raza. It's now called Unidos U.S., right? Which meant that I was a Latina from a Latino-focused institution trying to influence public policy. And the assumption that people make when you are talking about your own community, particularly if it's one that, that they're less familiar with, is that you're speaking from emotion and not on an empirical basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and though, and that gives them permission to kind of discount what you say, right? For the longest time, it was like think tanks that didn't have minority leadership who would successfully raise money to study us. But if we tried to raise money from the same sources, it was like, well, no, but you're going to be biased, right? The, these people who don't, who aren't you, are therefore neutral, uh, as if anyone is actually neutral doesn't start with a point of view, and you all probably biased. Um, so that meant I got, I got brought up to be ultra empirical, right? Since the assumption was, oh, they're, they're making stuff up or they're talking from emotion or they just have an ax to grind. Um, it, it, it created more necessity for us to say, no, actually, here's what the data says. And to make the most conservative assumptions about what the data says so that nobody could accuse us of messing with the numbers. Um, so it means that in speaking truth to power, you have to make sure to marshal your evidence mm -hmm. that there's almost a higher standard for you if you're speaking about something you know. Um, and, so and so I would frequently refrain from making my argument kind of in the moment because I wanted to step back and make sure I had my evidence and make sure I had my allies and make sure I had my stories to illustrate like I, Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure I had a whole strategy because I did not want to want to, you know, be discounted because I was talking about something I knew. That, that you actually lived and experienced in the community as you were engaged in. You know, it's interesting because it's sort of you're talking in, in a way to me, and, and you know, correct me if I'm if I'm misinterpreting uh, what you're saying, but you're talking about the importance of marrying evidence with narrative, which is actually what uh, Fritz Fritz Mayer's work is is about, and something that I think you know older styles of teaching public policy making possibly discounted, right? The the importance of narrative and storytelling, and and how we kind of uh, try to. Um, communicate to, to, to senior officials. So another question from uh, Jin uh, Suchia, uh, who is one of our alumni, um, asks, would you please share more about your local advocacy engagement? Um, they've worked on local policy issues for a long time, usually on issues uh, where they were the only one advancing them, mostly local health policy issues. It seems like everybody re recognizes local as the way to go now, Jin says, and expand the core services of local governments. Would you agree with that? How would you, how would you think about that? Yeah, you know, they say, we talk about the states as laboratories for democracy, and that is is, it seems more visibly true and local governments even more so. Um, that's where the innovation is happening right now. Like if we're going to solve our challenges with public safety, for example, to use a very topical issue, um, that that's not going to come from the federal government, right? The federal government, there are 18,000 police forces in the United States, local police forces. It's an, an, an with the exception of, you know, the, the federal agencies, policing is a locally driven thing. And if we're going to, if it's going to be different, that's going to happen, at, those innovations are going to happen with local governments. So I spent a lot of time in the federal government supporting, I mean, my first three years in the White House, I was the director of intergovernmental affairs, which meant I met, I worked with governors and mayors and tribal leaders. Mm -hmm. And Frequently, the places where you road test the ideas, which then should become state policy or federal policy, is in a city or in a county or in right in a in a local community. Um, we developed an initiative in the federal government that I'm really really proud of, called Promise Zones, not to be confused with Opportunity Zones that were created in the most recent tax bill. But Promise Zones were an effort to for the federal government to recognize a locally driven initiative which could be driven by a mayor or it could be driven by a community association 
where we treated them as equals. But what the federal government said to them was, come up with a thing that you're trying to change. Tell us what your roadmap is for how to change it, who your partners are, how you're gonna measure your progress. And you know, we will you compete with others who are doing the same thing and you'll get a designation which will give you access to federal dollars. Um, and, uh, and there are tw 20 promise zones now around the country that were uh, initiated in the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And but what we did was encourage people to look inward, right? But organize locally, but use some of the best and most sophisticated, you know, kind of techniques and, and, and strategies that the federal government supported them in doing. Um, and, you know, the stuff that folks are working on and the changes they've been able to make in the local communities in really difficult places like the east side of San Antonio or Newark, New Jersey um, is really impressive. Um, I deeply believe that we have the capacity to solve our most pressing public problems, that we already have it. And in fact, there are good people doing it all the time. Um, and our job is to make sure that stuff spreads around. And filters up. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're, you know, what you're kind of describing, um, you know, the picture that you're painting is is one that in the conventional wisdom, I think perhaps people think, again, of public policy is like, you know, people sitting in government, you know, making decisions up here for, for communities down here, and it's sort of delivered to these communities, and that may be where criticism comes from and where trust in government sort of erodes and so on. I think what you're describing is, you know, a, a perspective that I very much share, is that public policy is all sorts of people and all walk, walks of life doing all sorts of things, right? It's not just joining government. It's not just, it's, of course, your, your career sort of reflects this. It's, it's advocacy. It's direct services. It's all these things. We have a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, I'm guessing from current uh, MPP students who are asking for young professionals who want to reach the level of policy advisors uh, to politicians and leaders, even to the White House, uh, like, like, like you did. What sorts of skills do you think need to be polished, honed, and developed? And what's your advice in terms of getting started for, for people who want to engage in a, in a public policy career over the course of their, uh, their career trajectories? The most important thing is to figure out what, what are the issues that you're deeply in love with that, you, that, that wake you up in the morning because they're so interesting or they're so personal or they're, they're so meaningful to you. I, I, as somebody who hires public policy professionals, I, you know, I can spot the difference between somebody who's thinking, you know, this job would look pretty good on my resume versus somebody who's thinking, I really want it. This is like why I get up in the morning is I want to make a difference on this thing. And the, so figuring out like where I think of it as a continuum, like if from if with organizing on one end and maybe sort of and government service on the other end and there's policy advocacy and think tanks and lots of things in between. Figuring out where it is you belong on the continuum, like wh where is the place where you feel like your voice is strongest and what are the issues that really, really animate you. Are the, those things are the are the things that you will be successful doing because you're because you love them right because they they get your blood flowing, and in terms of the skills that are useful anywhere along that continuum, I look for people who are passionate, who write well, who speak well, right, who can take a complex issue and explain what you most need to know in a page, right? That is the that is the 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 ultimate policymaker skill set, like the 50 page policy paper, super important to understand the depth of an issue, not so useful when you are trying to staff the president of the United States, because he, he, you know, he's got 20, 25 memos in his book every night. And if yours is 50 pages, it's not happening. So the ability to synthesize complexity down to what is it that the a decision maker needs to know? What is it that a reporter needs to know to understand an issue? What is it that a voter needs to know to understand an issue? That's the ultimate skill set. Which is, of course, the opposite of what we learn at PhD school, right? But, uh, <laughs> and indeed, that's what our Bridging the Gap project is, is really kind of uh, sort of, you know, uh, pointed toward, which is uh, training and encouraging academics uh, to, you know, be able to, to have conversations with policymakers in the very concise ways that you're suggesting are, are necessary. So from uh, Hinckley Jones uh, Sanpai, who's a, uh, on the faculty here at the Corbell School, uh, given the overlap between different domestic policy areas, such as civil rights, the economy, workers' rights, and health care, as you were just describing, what would be your priority list for, for a new administration? Well, we have to build a new economy. 
um, and that's, and obviously we have to get the virus under control. Um, in some ways, getting the virus under control is, is it has to be job one because everything else flows from that. But but building a new economy in a way that which is in a in a way which is different, that recognizes the role of caregivers, for example, um, is I think fundamental and it's an enormous undertaking and it has to happen fast. Um, you know, there's that that saying that you may have heard about never letting a crisis go to waste, and I believe in this case it's really true. Like shame on us if we now that we can see so many of these inequalities laid bare that now that we can see that like lack of broadband access in poorer communities or communities of color isn't just like a thing that the tech people should be worried about but rather is fundamental to whether or not a young person can get an education mm -hmm. like shame on us if we having recognized that don't do something about it um, so I think reshaping the economy is, is absolutely fundamental um, to, frankly, to everything else. And th then the other thing that, you know, you don't need me to tell you is how important it is to get back to the business of addressing our piece of climate change and helping lead the world again. Um, you know, hard to overstate how important that is given what we know and what we're, what we're living through and what so many on the planet are beginning to live through. Indeed. Um, I, I would uh, love to kind of continue that line of uh, questioning, but we, I'm afraid we only have a, a couple of minutes left. And I just wanted to ask a couple more of the questions that are that are in the chat. Really, really great questions. One from Madeline Membrino, who's one of our MPP students, who asks, how do you incorporate policy work into more traditional organizing and activism? Oh, I love this question. This is so important because there is so much right now that, frankly, we need to be just plain righteous about, right? So we're, we can see things that are happening and part of the job of an activist is to lift them up. And it, of course, so that's kind of step one. But then step two is understanding and developing the strategy for, for this, what, hap, what connects the thing that you're trying to lift up, which needs to be fixed, and the strategy for fixing it. And it's the strategy for fixing it that where the public policy knowledge comes in, right? And I, my great fear, having come from an advocacy movement, is that there is so much to be angry about that we can expend all of our energy just on the being angry and lifting up the bad thing. And that work is tremendously important, but it is most impactful if it is also married to, and here's, the, here's where we are trying to get, and here are the steps we think are necessary to get there because then you can start to hold policymakers accountable to something. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, and there isn't nearly enough connection between policy expertise and advocacy and organizing. And the more those things are connected, the more successful we're gonna be. Right. Um, I, I find that incredibly inspiring. I want to pull on that thread just a little bit more. I'll take my prerogative as the person actually interviewing you um, and, and ask how um, in the immigration policy sphere in particular, you could see that sort of, you know, what what's possible in terms of what could happen in, in, in the next few years um, in terms of marrying that sort of the, the anger, the rage uh, and the and the activism with a strategy for, for, for kind of making real change on the immigration front. I really think, I mean, it's not easy, but I really think we have a chance to remake both what happens at the border and, uh, and how our immigration system treats people. I think that's entirely possible. And I, I actually think the um, tragic excesses of this current administration, and I don't have words big enough for how tragic and excessive they are, have also opened, have also made visible to people around the country things that they didn't necessarily see before. And that's what gives us the opening to really change it in a fundamental way. We can be a country which has or, you know, order and fairness and humanity at the same time with respect to how we treat people at the border and in the interior who are from other countries. That is supposed to be who we are. It is not who we are, but it could be. <laughs> um, I, the policy is not actually hard. Um, that it's the, you know, it's, it's, some of it is a question of political will. And, and that is utterly within our grasp, but we do have to show up and insist on it. Right. 
Um, and I, I like the your emphasizing of the of the concept of fairness and justice and in, in, in these things that I think we as you were pointing out before when we were talking about economic growth, things that can get lost in the sort of in the in the pros and cons and the cost benefit analysis and so on that to sort of not lo lose sight of our kind of shared human uh, concept of what's fair. Um, Last question then from, from the group, and I want to end on a, on a, a note of hope, uh, as you've kept coming back to, and I very, very much appreciate that. From Christian Thomas, what gives you hope in spite of everything that's happened this year? I think the generation coming up behind mine um, is so much better at it than we ever were. So much better at it, understands so much the relationship between different communities and different sets of issues and the fact that that we're really only going to get there if we link arms and try to get there together. Um, the level of sophistication of and, and uh, the understanding of the um, how fundamental issues of race and ethnicity and, and justice are to everything, it just feels way ahead of where my generation was at this stage. Uh, President Obama likes to say this a lot. He says his kids' generation just completely gives him hope because they just totally get stuff that it took us a minute to get to. Um, and, you know, the look, the immediate term in front of us is pretty scary. Um, the longer time horizon, I actually have a lot of hope about because of, of because of who's coming up and the, the, the way they see the world, both as it is and as it should be. Right. Well, the generation that you are describing are the students that we have here at the, the Corbell School, of course, as well as uh, President Obama's kids, your kids. Um, and I wanted to thank you so much, Cecilia, for, for being here with us. What we're trying to build here at the Scrivener Institute with, with enormous gratitude to, to Doug and Mary Scrivener and the Corbell School uh, more generally is an inclusive engaged and innovative public policy program, which is really first and foremost dedicated to the collective good. Um, your career embodies just those uh, values, and it's such an honor to have been able to have this uh, conversation with you as my first public event. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you uh, to our trusty audience for being with us, too. Cecilia, I'll leave the last word to you. Well, I'm incredibly honored to have been the inaugural speaker for the series, and I um, it's just, it's so exciting to see so many people interested in having this kind of conversation about policy with this kind of focus. And Naz, I wish you every, every success in this new adventure. It could not be more important at this juncture and there couldn't be anyone better for leading this. So thank you for letting me be a part of it. And thanks to everybody who joined us. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Great to see you. Likewise.